Oh, thanks so much. To God be the glory. <laughs> so I'm Brett Tolman. I'm the executive director of Ride on Crime. Um, let me let me give you just a brief history of, of my background, and then I want to uh, introduce our distinguished panel. And this will be, you know, I think a discussion like no other. Um, it's it's a privilege to be here with the the great group of people at um, policy orientation. Um, even more so, I I value my opportunity to be with. Uh, sheriffs and law enforcement and um, prosecutors, <clears throat> very dear to my heart. I grew up with a father that was a peace officer in LA uh, during the Watts riots and, and used to tell us stories. I grew up with a profound appreciation for law enforcement. I became a federal prosecutor and did that for about a decade. Um, I, I then went back to the United States Senate and I served there as chief counsel over crime and terrorism issues that took me all over the globe. Um, investigating and, and appreciating the challenge that it is to be in law enforcement. I was asked by President Bush to be the U.S. Attorney, and the very last case I did, President Obama came in and I asked if I could stay as U.S. Attorney uh, to finish the last case I did, which was to prosecute the kidnapper of Elizabeth Smart. So my, my last hurrah in the courtroom was to put a very bad man away for the rest of his life. Very proud of that work. In that time frame, though, I learned a lot about the criminal justice system. You're talking over 20, 20 years in the criminal justice system. And it's not surprising that polling is suggesting that 80 plus percent of the United States wants aspects of the criminal justice system to be changed, to, you know, to mitigate the destructive impact that sometimes the criminal justice system has. So welcome to this panel. I want to announce that this panel is CLE accredited. To get CLE credit, fill out the sign-in sheet in the back of the room on your way out. If you're watching online, scan the QR code on the panel page to submit your credit request. Please send any questions to events at texaspolicy.com. So without further ado, let me introduce our guest. We have Jerron, who is, and I know he didn't want me to give him a hard time, but Jerron's actually in San Antonio. That's where he thought the conference was. I'm kidding. Jerron wasn't able to make it in. He's joining us um, via this feed. And, and I'm very honored to have Jerron. He is not only a friend, but he has been a colleague. When I was working in private practice and started to work to change you know, some of the criminal justice uh, issues in this country, Jerron was working on the Hill. How long, how long did you work there, Jerron? I worked on the Hill for 10 years. For 10 years. Um, he knew more than any, any member of Congress on the issue, that, that's for sure. And uh, I was honored to work with him then and then afterwards. Um, I was thrilled to get a call from him and uh, Jared Kushner asking me to come and help advise the White House on criminal justice issues. Jerron served as President Trump's highest and longest ranking African American advisor serving in the White House in a variety of roles including Deputy Assistant to the President for Domestic Policy and Deputy Director um, for the Office uh, for, of the White House for the Office of American Innovation. Um, Jerron is, is a family man with, with um, a great passion, a love of family and God, and I, I've learned to really respect that. But one thing I'm very fond about is you hear President T Trump and others tout the First Step Act. It was a monumental piece of legislation that changed um, aspects of the criminal justice system. And at the heart of that was a bill that Jerron and I and others uh, helped to draft, which would allow for the first time in the federal system individuals to earn credit by participating in programs, training, and education while they're incarcerated. And so it, it would not have happened without Jerron. Um, most recently, he served as the executive director of the Center of Advance, for Advancing Opportunity, developing research-based solutions to issues including criminal justice reform. <clears throat> Thanks, Jerron, for, for being here. We have Sheriff, Sheriff Brian Hawthorne. <clears throat> I'll, I'll give you 10 bucks if you can pick him out. <clears throat> He's been serving uh, the citizens of Chambers County here in Texas, uh, which is between Houston and Beaumont, for almost nine years. Um, those, those, are, those count as double, right, when you're, when you're in law enforcement. Every year is, is double. 
Um, before that, he served 28 years with the Texas Department of Public Safety as a trooper, patrol sergeant, and special assistant to the director. Sheriff Hawthorne currently serves as both vice chairman of the DPS Trooper Foundation and chairman for the Legislative Committee of Texas Sheriff's Association. Down on the, the end, let me introduce Scott McNaughton. Um, really appreciate Scott. Um, you know, he reached out and asked if he could get involved in, in uh, Ride on Crime and, and work with us. And, uh, you know, be careful what you ask for, because <laughs> we immediately asked him to be on this panel. Um, I, I, in a short period of time, have seen his passion and appreciate him. Scott has worked in Texas law enforcement and public safety for more than a decade, with the last seven years um, working for one of our, well, our large um, urban prosecutor's office as an investigator. A former patrol officer, criminal investigator, and supervisor, Scott has been involved in criminal investigations ranging from misdemeanors to capital crimes. Scott is also an advisor to officials in the public sector, in public safety, and criminal justice. He is currently, and he is, cur he is a current criminal justice appointee of Texas Governor Greg Abbott. And sitting in between Scott and the sheriff, we have Kurt Altman, who is a friend of mine, and I asked him to, uh, to jump in the seat so we didn't have a vacant seat. But he's, he's more than just a seat filler. Um, so <laughs> Kurt, Kurt is a former federal prosecutor like myself, but also a former state prosecutor. And currently, he is the state director uh, for Arizona uh, for Right on Crime. He's, he's a right-hand man to me, but uh, he also is running really the first in the country uh, effort to reform prosecutors and prosecutions across this country and heads up that program for me. So please give a warm welcome to our guest today. So I want to make sure that I want to make sure that we all kind of appreciate where things are at. At Right on Crime, our focus is, and as you see crime rates spiking on violent crime, on homicides, and, and very concerning you know, uh, areas of this country, you can, you can directly correlate it to the policies that are being implemented. And we're going to talk about some of those, whether it's uh, the defund the police effort, whether it's you know, refusals to prosecute certain crimes, bail reform. We're going to try to hit on each of these, but give you a perspective from law enforcement, um, from the side of, you know, what, what are the areas that need to be changed and what shouldn't be changed. At Ride on Crime, we are a major campaign of TPPF. And why? Because there is not a single effort over the past three decades to truly hold the criminal justice system accountable outside of what Ride on Crime is trying to do, while at the same time preserving uh, public safety. Now, you'll, you'll have a lot of advocates that are trying to change the criminal justice system, but they do so based on emotion and based on cases sometimes that capture your attention in the media, but it's not always based in data or driven by sound policy and thoughtful analysis. And so that's why it's such an important component. So right now I want to start, and um, I'm going to throw this out to, to everyone on the panel and just feel free to, to weigh in if you want. But, um, Jaron, if you'll lead us off on this, <clears throat> policing reform is a conversation that you and I have been involved in for, for a long time. Um, with defund the police and with, um, you know, all that's going on across this nation on a, on a national scale, what, what are conservatives um, supposed to do when the country is expecting some reform in policing? Sure. Well, first I would like to say, uh, as it relates to policing, you know, the police officers have had the toughest job to do in our country for a long time. And it's been harder for them to do their job um, in this current environment. And this predates um, George Floyd, uh, you know, recruiting um, for the police in, in different uh, urban areas around the country has been a challenge. Um, and professionalizing a pol the police department um, is, is something that many police groups that I've spoken with uh, would like to uh, create an opportunity around. Um, and so I think that uh, we have a lot of work ahead of us um, because more, now more than ever, uh, we need strong police departments. 
And uh, I spent the last summer uh, trying to work with Senator Scott and Senator Booker. Um, and as you know, Brett, um, when I worked in the White House, I uh, wrote an executive order, um, uh, Tr President Trump's executive order around policing. And uh, I learned a lot of valuable things. Uh, one, um, no one hates a bad cop as much as a, a good cop. And uh, police um, departments um, all across the board um, want to do whatever they can to get the best in class as it relates to policing, which is why we, our executive order, really focused on uh, creating standards um, uh, around uh, how we get our police departments um, uh, to be best in class. And we created incentives um, to allow for those police departments to um, invest in recruiting, um, invest into training, and then also um, creating the best in class standards that police group police groups agree agree upon. And so um, the other piece was um, police departments are also uh, stretched. Um, they're doing uh, work that's that's not really the work that police officers should focus on. Um, things like dealing with individuals who have mental health issues, um, dealing with the homelessness problem, um, and then also, um, in, in many cases, uh, dealing with individuals who have substance abuse. Um, we agreed on, on many different ways that we can look at ways that police departments can partner uh, with uh, social services organizations to, uh, um, to approach um, these, these difficult times, um, because many of the police and community interactions uh, deal with these issues um, where we, we're having someone that, that, that has been trained in dealing with trauma or um, uh, someone with substance abuse or someone who has a mental health issue. And so um, now more than ever, I think it's time for conservatives to invest in our police departments um, and help um, them be best in class because public safety is, is the number one thing um, that low-income communities uh, care about. Um, and, and it's the only way that we can start to rebuild those cities um, and, and, and low-income communities. If we're able to uh, uh, invest in our police departments and invest in public safety, then we're able to then move into looking at things like uh, economic development or uh, creating more job opportunities. Um, but it's hard to have both when crime is an issue. And so I think um, for the conservative movement, um, there's a huge focus on how we can work with our law enforcement um, agencies and, and departments all across the country. Um, under the Trump administration, because of our executive order, um, um, over uh, originally it was maybe like 1,000 police departments that had uh, um, got accredited. Um, and now we have over 5,000 police departments that are accredited. Uh, and, and what that means is, is they have the best in class uh, um, uh, uh, credentials uh, when it comes to policing. And we want to spread that out to all the 18,000 police departments. But it takes resources and it takes an investment um, into these departments, uh, which is the total opposite of this whole uh, campaign of, about defunding, um, which, which statistics have shown that no low-income community wants to defund the police. Um, everyone cares about public safety. And uh, so we have a lot in, in front of us. You know, I was recently just talking to Jim Jordan's office, and uh, we think we, we need to still push forward on um, doing reform that can invest in our police departments. Well, you know, Jaron, you, you raise an interesting point. Um, two, two quick things, and I, I want to turn to Scott and the sheriff to respond. You have, um, you, you see how it's going on the defund the police, right? Um, you see what happened here in Austin. You see um, across the Pacific Northwest. You see <clears throat> other areas that are, that are addressing, you know, the reaction. Uh, the other day I was shocked to hear the president say that, um, you know, George Floyd had a wider, more significant impact than Martin Luther King Jr. Um, you can see that they're utilizing that, you know, an event or an incident to um, justify a policy agenda that's built around emotion. But I have learned over my career that conservatives care about making changes, and they're also willing to admit changes need to be made. So, Sheriff and Scott, what 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 are law enforcement? What's law enforcement doing well? What do they need to improve um, in response to these, you know, the calls to defund the police? Well, thank you, thank you for having me, and I, I would say. The, uh, the number one thing that I, I see and feel has a lot to do with the money and the professionalism. So it's two things. Uh, 
myself and, and, and Sheriff Rand Henderson from Montgomery County is here in, in the room, and I appreciate him being here. We had dinner last night. We were talking about some of the issues that we were hoping to discuss today. And I would rather carry a vacancy than to have to go way down the, the hiring line to hire somebody to fill a position that later is going to cause a George Floyd type incident. Uh, it, it is all about the professionalism. Well, the professionalism comes with what? It's got to come with money. The only way you're going to get the professional is to properly pay them. And one of the problems that I think we're seeing today, there are billboards all over Southeast Texas where uh, uh, Sheriff Henderson and I uh, live and work that are recruiting, trying to recruit police officers to go all the way to Seattle and Portland and all over because they, uh, there's such a shortage of law enforcement and nobody wants to work in those cities. Well, they obviously they don't want to work in those cities because of the policies that have been put in play. And any time that you have to stand back and watch somebody destroy public buildings and federal courthouses and, and you just, we all watched it on television. Who would want to work as a police officer in that kind of a community? So it, it's a sad day that that's happened. I will tell you, it didn't happen here in Texas except here in Austin and a few of our major cities and it, and it got stopped real quick, you know, because of our governor and because of our leaders in our state legislature that didn't allow things like that to happen. We've not had any defunding issues really except for Austin. There were some calls for additional defunding in some of the other cities and big cities. I don't know of any from a county perspective. I think most of us, you know, we're a pretty conservative state as we all know. I'm a very conservative county. Uh, I, I feel blessed. My, my budget keeps growing. Um, and and I, I think it has a lot to do with the conservative citizens that I have. They want a safe community. They want to be able to lay their head down at night and feel safe and secure. And they want to know when they dial 911 that a sheriff's deputy or a police officer is going to come to that front door or back door or wherever they need, need them to be. So I, I will tell you these issues are not heavy here, but we do have them. But it is all about professionalism, education, and have to have the money to go with the education. Um, and and I, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Well, Scott, I want to hear your response, and I have a question, follow-up question for both of you. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I agree with a lot of the things the sheriff said. It does come down to you kind of get what you pay for. You have to be able to pay police officers to attract and recruit good police officers. And criminal justice reform has been demonized. That word kind of scares people. As a Republican, as a conservative, when I go talk to folks and say criminal justice reform, policing reform, it's typically interpreted as something that's just automatically bad, and it's from the left. And that's not, that's not really true. There are a lot of good things we can do on the criminal justice reform side, which includes law enforcement reform as police officers. There are things we can do better. That doesn't mean we should demonize police and say they're doing a bad job. But I think in any profession, you can always look at ways to do things a little bit better, which goes to what the sheriff said. But that takes money. You have to be able to pay for training. If you're providing new equipment, you have to be able to pay for the training on how to use that equipment properly. There's a lot that goes into that. And defunding the police, as many of these large cities have done, we're now seeing that shift where they're having to refund. But the chilling effect that those cities are going to have in place from defunding in the first place will last for years. If you're a qualified applicant looking to start your career in law enforcement, do you really want to go apply and go through this difficult process in a city that has shown they don't have the respect for their law enforcement in the first place? So I think what we're going to see as we move forward in this, that they're going to have a hard time attracting a lot of the quality candidates because why would you put yourself in a place where you're going to be demonized, possibly defunded again? So <clears throat> let me follow up then how, because it makes sense that you need professional law enforcement officers. They need to be able to react in sometimes impossible circumstances, but how do you hold them accountable? You know, as a country, we want to see accountab accountability in government. You are the front line with the most power. You have the power to take away someone's liberty. It's unique among all of government. So how do you hold officers more accountable uh, going forward? Learning the lessons we've learned about some of these tough cases like Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and others, how do we hold them accountable? And I'd like Kurt to weigh in on that as well. 
No, go ahead, Sheriff, first. Well, I, I will tell you, J. Ron nailed it. it. It literally is about accreditation and policies. Um, you know, uh, I came, I, I started my career with the Department of Public Safety where we had policy manuals that were too heavy to carry. Uh, but when I became a sheriff, I realized I walked into an office that had no policy manual. So I immediately, you know, my background was obviously trying to be an educated state trooper, so I be, tried to work on becoming an educated sheriff and immediately started creating and um, plagiarizing policies from other agencies, plagiarizing, pulling policies from uh, the Department of Public Safety, um, Houston Police Department, wherever I could find a policy that uh, I could put and I could model it for the sheriff's office. And, and that's the key. And, and I think any one of my deputies, I, I have about 75 commissioned officers that work the streets, detectives and, and uh, investigators and, and deputies, that would tell you that the sheriff's gonna hold me accountable for policies, whether it's, it's day off, written reprimands, or termination. Um, you know, you break a policy, there, there is a uh, internal affairs process, and when the, at the end of that internal affairs process, there's going to be punishment. Uh, and that's, I, it's very important, and you have to have those policies, you have to work to uh, have, get those accreditations that uh, J. Ron was talking about, they're, they're very important. Um, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over. Thanks, Sheriff. Is that working? Um, you know, the simple answer, I think, is you have to hold them accountable, just like the sheriff said. But that's difficult because we start from the premise, and I think this goes back to what Scott said. Uh, when you say something about reform, uh, whether it's prosecutorial reform, police reform, criminal justice reform, the immediate reaction is that we're coming from a place that they're bad that the police are bad or prosecutors are bad. And, and that's what I found in, in the job that I do for right on crime and, and otherwise. Uh, the most difficult part is to go out there and say, listen, when I say reform, like I'm one of you. I was a prosecutor for 17, 18 years, uh, did a lot of big cases, still the best job was sheriff and I were talking about this before. Best job I ever had, most fun, right? But a lot of responsibility. And that responsibility has to be accounted for from the top no matter what the agency is. And unfortunately, in today's day and age, uh, what we see on the media, what we see publicly, is never anything good about the police. Never anything good about prosecutors. You always, the, the news cycle is something bad that happens. So I think implementing the policies, holding your officers, your prosecutors accountable from the top is one thing, but I think also we need to do a better job as conservatives to promote what the police are doing and promote what prosecutors are doing. And I don't know, I, I'm not a media person, Tanya is. You know, she's down here taking some photos. Like, how do we do that? How do we get the message out about how good and how professional uh, Sheriff's Department is, uh, the Phoenix Police Department is? Um, that's what we have to do. Other than the policies, which everybody agrees with, with the accountability, how do we counteract, as conservatives, what the media is putting out there? the George Floyd stuff. You know, police departments are no different than any other business, any prosecutor's office, any private business. There's gonna be some great employees. Most of them are great, professional, caring. Some are not so good. That's the way society is. Those ones that are not so good have to be weeded out, and we have to promote uh, publicly, within, incentivize, whatever you wanna call it, the folks that are good and professional, because there's a lot more of them than there are the bad ones. Hey, Brad, can I, can I weigh in a little bit yeah, more yeah. on that? I, I think it's extremely important to understand that um, there, there's a lot of successes that, that's come from reform. When they did the Johnson Convention in the 60s, um, that created uh, things like 911 and police academies. And uh, what we're trying to say here is that um, in, in 21st century policing, on uh, what are the new things that we need to invest in our police departments to deal with the challenges um, of the 21st century? Um, you know, um, and the criminology, um, or even the police officers. Uh, mental health um, issues among police officers is a big issue. Um, suicide rates among police officers is extremely high. And so now it's more important than ever for us to, to make the right investment in these police departments and be careful not to implement policies that's going to disincentivize uh, individuals to, to want to join the police force. Um, you know, the approach towards qualified immunity um, uh, puts a lot of officers at risk um, and it makes it less likely for them to be able to recruit 
um, and grow their forces, um, especially in low income areas. Um, we know in, in many uh, areas that have resources, um, they can afford to pay their police officers um, a, a great deal of, of resources. But in those low income areas, um, they get hit the hardest um, when we pass policies that disincentivize individuals from being police. Um, and so I think uh, there's a lot of work for us to do here, um, and it's important for public safety um, because uh, individuals that sign up for this job, um, most of them are, are in it for the right reasons, and it's because they, they want to make sure that we have safe communities. Um, and in order to do that, we have to create um, infrastructure around them that can grow the departments. Um, and then lastly, um, around accreditation, uh, we also have to understand that um, many police departments in rural areas um, may not be able to afford uh, the accreditation standards. And so um, we've talked to Congress about um, allowing for uh, special investment into those police departments. So you don't have, uh, you know, like the sheriff's police department, uh, him trying to figure out things on his own. Um, and I think through the um, President Trump's executive order, um, we we're able to move in that direction because many states um, have now created their own accreditation bodies. And so um, smaller the police departments um, now have an avenue to um, creating the highest, highest standards around recruiting, um, de-escalation training, um, as well as uh, um, officer mental health. And so I just wanted to kind of add that to the conversation as well. Appreciate that. Scott, any other thoughts? Yeah, with what Jeron said, I, it's good if you could get the state to chip in and incentivize these small agencies who typically can't afford. They have very limited budgets. They're controlled by their local governmental bodies. If you could incentivize somehow from the state or federal level to get them accredited, and if not accredited, because that's typically an expensive process, and right now it's, I think it mainly applies to larger agencies, but if you could get them access to best practices, policies, quality training that they may not be able to put on in their own backyard, but if you could have some way to pay for, for larger outfits to help train them and give them some of the resources, such as what the Department of Public Safety has, I think that would help them out a lot, but it, takes, it all comes back to money that most of them don't have. Well, I wanna shift gears a little bit too. Um, you, you hear people reference the over-criminalization problem in the country, and let me, let me give you just a, a bit of perspective. One in every three Americans has a criminal um, history, has a criminal record. <clears throat> One perspective that might help you, if, when Ronald Reagan was president, we had roughly about 900 or so federal criminal statutes. So I'm just talking about the federal system. Today, we have over 5,000 federal criminal statutes, and we have over 300,000 regulations, federal regulations with criminal penalties. It is a 500% increase in those that are incarcerated in this country from just a few decades ago. We incarcerate the most people in the world. Now, I don't know of anyone that really has been in the system who can't identify ways in which we have over-criminalized some things in this country. To give you a perspective, when I was working in Congress, <clears throat> I just sort of sat back and watched and was, was just marveling at politicians jumping over each other. And it happened on both you know, the Democrats and the Republicans to pass more criminal statutes to show that they were really tough right, on, on crime. The definition of tough on crime was simply passing laws that put people away for a long time. And they jumped over each other to try to accomplish that. What didn't happen was asking and digging in, utilizing the experts who are in the trenches and understand the criminal justice system to identify what should and shouldn't be done. I'll give you an example of a case that <clears throat> I worked on. Um, kid, young kid, no, virtually no criminal history, had a bad weekend, no, nobody got hurt, but the way the statutes are in the federal system, he was looking at 170 years in federal prison with no parole. There's no parole in the federal system. Now, I had to get special approval to offer him 35-year plea deal, which he took. And I'm in touch with his, his family, and now that I'm not, no longer a prosecutor, 
And we talk all the time about how this is an incredible young man that's going to make a big difference when he gets out, but he's still got 20 some odd years in his sentence. So the question I have for the panel is, how do we do it smarter? How do we, re how do we redefine tough on crime as actually lower recidivism, lowering the crime rate, while not just throwing people into incarceration for longer than necessary periods of time? We'll start with, uh, why don't we go with you, uh, Kurt? Uh, thanks, Brett. Uh, you know, that's a huge issue. Overcriminalization is something that I've been dealing with my, my entire uh, career. And, and I have really, uh, I think, progressed. I won't say progressive. I know that's probably a bad word here. Um, in my views on that, you know, before, I, when I was a young prosecutor, I'm like, oh, yeah, this guy did this, and here's what the statute says, and we're going to go get him. And then you realize that this is a human business. You know, it is a human business, the law, criminal justice, and you're dealing with humans who are clearly imperfect. Uh, and each one, there, sh there needs to be consistency, but this, justice should be individualized, too. Uh, and when it comes to over-criminalization, what I have found in my practice as well is you'd be amazed. We're talking about money for police agencies. You would be amazed at the amount of money that is spent on just police officers just arresting, taking, taking the court on small little misdemeanor things that are not, shouldn't even really be crimes. So you talk about somebody having a bad weekend, a young man having a bad weekend. Next thing you know, they're in city court over and over again and they hire a lawyer and then the lawyer's in court over and over again. Then the police officers have to come in when, when there's totally other ways to do that. So I look at the, the system and the overcriminalization from two aspects. Front, I say front end and back end. I talked to a lot of lawmakers. I hope there's some here. Um, and, and I try to make it as simple as possible. Why do we put people into the system, not even prison, into the system? What starts that? And then when they are in the system, what do we do with them when they're getting out? Because they're all going to get out, whether they're in prison, on probation, or whatever. And I think we need to view uh, the system from both ends, right? We need to work on going, does this person need to be prosecuted for a felony? Does this person need to go to prison on the front end? Is there alternate things that we can do? Because ultimately, we want that person to be better in society and, and do better and go on and put them in prison. Mm, maybe not for this drug user. And then once we do, uh, you forget about how they got there. We have a lot of people in prison, more than any other civilized country. Right in Arizona, where I'm from, um, we're at, like, we go up and down, we're at about 48,000 people in the Department of Corrections right now. They're all getting out. 95% of them are getting out. What are we doing for those people that we put in there for whatever reason when they get out? Now, they have to want to help themselves as well, but we can't just open the door, throw them out and say, good luck, thanks, because we'll see them again. And I think that's the two areas we really need to focus on. Why do we call this a crime? Why do we prosecute this person on the front end? And then when we do, for whatever reason, what are we going to do with them on the way out? And I think it's changing, and I think that's what we work on on a daily basis. So, Sheriff, what, what on the front end? You're the, you're the first responder on some of these. How, how can you impact um, that over-criminalization issue, but at the same time ensure safety in your community? Well, it's a, it's a balance, and I, I will tell you that one of the things that, uh, as a sheriff, you have to be careful of is pushing my thoughts and my perception down to the men and women that, that work for me, at the same time asking them not to judge people. So, and, and what I mean by that is a, a, a very recent case where one of my deputies makes a stop, stops a very good young man, he's in college, and he has some marijuana on him. The deputy starts asking him questions. Deputy goes back to his car to do something, and the young man takes the little bag, very small bag of marijuana, drops it on the ground. The deputy doesn't realize it, but when he walks back up and he's interaction, inter, having interaction with this young man again, he looks down and he sees his bag of marijuana, and he looks at it, picks it up, and says, this yours. And the young man kind of stutters a little bit. The deputy goes back, watches the car, in-car camera, and it, you can see it all take place. Well, he not only arrests him for the marijuana, but then he arrests him for tampering with evidence. And 
I immediately saw that as a overreach. But it was clear in the law book that he could do it. It was a, it was a very good charge. And then I find myself as a sheriff trying to explain to the parents of a very good young man why we now have him in our jail on a felony because he dropped the bag of marijuana. So there are, and, and then it's of such a fine line for me to get involved. And I, I know Sheriff Henderson knows exactly what I mean because there's a difference between, you know, who, who, is, who is the real criminal? This, this young man was not a real criminal other than the fact that he, he was obviously like marijuana a little bit. And that we get into the whole marijuana issue here because there's nothing worse than having a jail full of people that are sitting in your, where I, I need jail space, I need the jail beds, and I have people in there for offenses that just, we shouldn't even be incarcerating them. But the bail system won't let them out or they've been arrested so many times they don't meet the criteria. I mean, we could go on and on. So I will tell you that it's a real problem. It, it is a real problem uh, over enforcing, so to speak. But the one thing I have to do is you have to treat everybody the same. Because if, if, I, if I tell that deputy, we're not going to arrest that young man for that, but what we are going to arrest the other young man for that, now what kind of a professional am I? So it's, it's a, it is truly a catch-22 balance. Yeah, and, and I love that story because it, it emphasizes that culture is important, right? The, the way in which the, you view certain cases and maybe stepping back when you're, you're, you're an officer responding. I recall my father talking about having to go pick up a, a guy that had a warrant, walked into the bar, and he could see on this man's face, he could see his level of desperation. He broke a bottle and said, you're not taking me, copper. And, uh, and my father walked in and said, Johnny, I'm the only friend you got in this whole bar right now. And he just broke down, you know. And, and my father had a different attitude then. It wasn't like it, some, it, it has to be right now. <clears throat> what change, you know, what a significant change in that young man's life if he doesn't have a felony but he does learn some other lessons. So we do have to get to a different place. Scott, your thoughts on you know, how law enforcement can affect over-criminalization? Just coming off of the sheriff's story, you know, the, the effects of having uh, a conviction for that type of offense or even an arrest uh, can linger for years for that young man. Well, we're all human beings. We make bad judgment calls. We make mistakes. Uh, getting housing, getting apartment, getting employment now may be much more difficult with something like that on your record. And, and it affects your life for years to come for something as simple right now as a, a misdemeanor marijuana charge. But I can tell you from the prosecution standpoint, uh, from what I can see, offices are absolutely being squeezed with misdemeanor narcotics cases and state jail narcotics cases. They make up a huge, huge number of the cases submitted and um, seeing it from when I worked on patrol on the street to seeing it as I have the last few years in a prosecutor's office, it's very different. And you realize, as we do in law enforcement agencies, there are limited resources in a prosecutor's office. And you want to make the most of those resources. You want to focus on the people we're not just mad at, but the people that are going to go and hurt us. Um, so when we talk about misdemeanor, marijuana, misdemeanor drug cases, state jail drug cases, I think there are worthwhile discussions to be had about effective diversion programs so we aren't putting those people in the system the first time, where we can give them a chance to be held accountable and also be able to not have those create these problems that would follow them down the road. Well, and think about the impact on violent crime if you can free up your investigators and your law enforcement officers to be focused on that issue rather than some of the menial work that they do, some of the tedious responses they have to do. And and we have overburdened law enforcement in that in that regard. I want to shift gears and Jaron, I want you to weigh in on this. <clears throat> we you know, the left doesn't always get it right, and the right doesn't get, always get it right when they're trying to make policy. But lately, the left has just been really bad, right? like, just awful on, on some policies. If you look at the, the, the way they've tried to address bail reform, you look at New York, and what do you hear? What do you see? And, and <clears throat> what happened in, in, in Waukesha, right? 
How is an individual like that not in custody when there's so many warning signs? And so while we, while we want to free up our officers and our law enforcement to investigate um, violent crime, there's a bail problem, a bail reform need in this country that is substantial. In Texas, I'm so proud of you all. I'm proud of Nikki Presley, our, our state director, proud of all those that advocated and the, and the members of the legislature and the speaker, speaker Phelan and others who worked very hard to change the bail system here in Texas so that judges can start to look at risk of and danger. But Jaron, tell me, tell me what, um, what you would you would say? Did we lose Jaron? Okay, there he is. Jaron, tell us um, still here about bail across this country and how what what conservative bail reform means and what works and doesn't. Well, one, and let me just kind of comment on the last conversation. You know, um, we can't take this uh, one size fit all approach towards criminal justice. Um, I, I, I like the way that we went towards reform in our justice system with the first step back because it um, led on uh, us being smart on crime, taking a very scalpel approach. And I think conservatives, as it relates to bail reform, um, want to take a scalpel approach towards that and um, look at the individual. You know, is this individual um, um, a, a violent uh, a individual who will um, victimize um, more individuals if you let them out? Um, I think that's the first pillar of any reform around uh, um, you know, public safety is first, uh, do no harm. Um, we don't want to put any citizens um, at risk of um, you know, losing their life or um, um, being hurt um, by a perpetrator that we had in custody. Um, and and that's, that's kind of the, 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 the big issue around bail reform. Um, in many liberal cities, they were taking that blanketed approach and allowing even violent citizens who um, pop, um, pose a risk to public safety um, have the same opportunity as an individual that's nonviolent, um, which is why we took this nuanced approach with the First Step Act. Um, the only way that you're even allowed to, under the First Step Act, to get the opportunity to serve some of your time at home confinement is for you to be a minimum to a no risk of recidivism. Um, and we do an analysis on each individual's criminology and see their risk of returning to prison. Um, and since the passage of the First Step Act, you've seen recidivism um, in federal prisons drop from 30% to 11%. Um, and that's the type of reform we need because that helps with public safety. Um, in many states, you have recidivism that is high as 70%. So we know where our next uh, criminal is coming from. They're coming straight from the prison. Um, which is why we took this uh, very nuanced approach um, with creating incentives um, for individuals to participate in recidivism reduction uh, programming. Um, and that's also the reason why we did these reform efforts with law enforcement. Um, you can't uh, reform some of these uh, systems and, and these nuances without having um, individuals like the sheriff who can tell you how it affects their practice and their ability to do their job. Um, and then most importantly, um, as we take this very nuanced approach, it allows uh, law enforcement to focus on uh, those individuals who are going to do the most harm to society. Um, and so um, all in all around bail reform, um, that's the nuance. You know, we, we have to be very careful about um, who we're letting go. Um, and I think conservatives um, around the country uh, are focused on making sure that those violent individuals um, aren't put back on the streets and that um, if we're if we're going to allow for an individual um, to come home, well, those are going to be the individuals that um, have the least amount of risk with doing any type of harm to society. Yeah, thanks, John. I, we've got four minutes. I'll open the same question up on on bail and some of the issues uh, to the rest of the panel, and then we'll have um, questions from the audience. Well, I, I will tell you and. The best statement that uh, I can really put to it is there's nobody that wants somebody out of the jail more than the sheriff. I can, I can assure you, all right? I don't care whether you have a jail that has 25 beds or a jail that has 8,000 beds. That is 25 problems or 8,000 problems that the sheriff is dealing with in some form or fashion. Their liability is the largest liability that we have on our counties. I don't, I don't care how many lawsuits a county gets or how many lawsuits are filed in county, the sheriff and the county judge are probably sued the most and it's normally coming out of the jail. So 
I will tell you that we want them out of jail, but we don't want the violent ones out of jail. So the bail reform that we're working towards now that we've finished up in this uh, special session, yet to be seen how it's going to work. We, we, we feel like it's going to work well. Uh, I know the sheriffs are all crossing our fingers, and we're trying to work through some issues right now. But uh, There's refining, right? Every time there's a policy, there's refining. We also have to deal with the, the, the constitutional amendment that needs to, to that, take that, place. That is correct. There's, there's still a lot needs to be done on it. But bottom line is, is we want them out of jail. We just don't want the violent ones out of jail. I, I don't want the sons and daughters and those people in jail that really need help. I won't even get into the mental health issue. I sit on my local mental health authority, board of directors. The problems that we have that we see in our jail is there's no doubt everybody in this room probably realizes that the county jail is the largest mental health hospital in any county is the jail. And, and that's they don't belong there. And um, it shouldn't be that way. No, I mean, it just and, clearly and, should not be that way. There's so many problems that come as a result of that. Scott, Kurt, any uh, couple minutes on bail? I don't know that I can talk a couple minutes on bail because it's such a big deal, but what I'll say, what I think we've moved away from a lot, there's so many presumptions of detention, there are presumptions of release, and then legislatures pass some other law when something bad happens where everybody's got to stay in jail. There are actors in the criminal justice system that all have a job. Lawyers, prosecutor, defense lawyer, judge, right? And I think we need to get back to advocacy, advocacy easy for me to say, right? Um, in the criminal justice system, and that comes with bail too. If, if the, the parties can make their argument and advocate why this person should be in or should be out, then the judge makes that decision based on informed uh, information, right? So that's way oversimplified, but all these presumptions where someone's either gonna stay in custody or somebody's gotta get out of custody, uh, depending on the crime, I think as we move to make it easier, or more determinate, it becomes more problematic. So that's my two cents. I'll just add in real quick. I think two of the most important parts of the bail reform that was just passed and signed by the governor during the session, a special session, a special session uh, was there are two components. One is it requires that a public safety report um, be held by the Office of Court Administration, and that report must be accessed and reviewed by any magistrate who is making a determination on somebody's bail. So as opposed to before, they have to look and consider someone's history before letting them out. The idea behind that is if this person has a violent past and is a threat to the community, then we're going to make our decision based on that information. And the second part of that is it um, requires that while they review that, they have to take it into consideration. And I think that's really important. It also restricts use of PR bonds. Um, for a lot of the violent offenses that we've seen, which really brought this whole bail reform to the forefront, was the misuse, egregious use of PR bonds in violent offenses. So ideally, this reform should help patch those two things up, which I think are really important. Thank you. Uh, questions? Thank you. Did we lose Jaron, or do we have him? Still. No, I'm, I'm still here. I just, I had, uh, I lost my video capability. <laughs> okay. Hello, um, I'm curious. What are your thoughts on the private prisons in America? Do you see it as a successful thing or not? I'll open it up. Go ahead. I, I, yeah, I, I, I have can, thoughts, I can, but I know. I Kurt can speak probably. to that. Um, I think in, in this era that we live in, we need the, whatever prison provides the best opportunity to lower recidivism risk. And so uh, whether it's private or public, um, in many cases, you see a lot of private prisons doing a lot more work around programming and have uh, been really exemplary about uh, their recidivism um, to that specific prison. And so um, this whole notion about private prisons um, being awful um, is, is not really uh, correct. In some, in some cases, some of the public prisons um, have been uh, some of the the worst prisons in our country. And so um, I push back for that because you know, I've worked with uh, certain organizations like the GEO Group who've uh, done some great programming um, in their prisons and have showed to reduce recidivism. Um, but I think uh, a lot of individuals on the left like to push back against private prisons and create this conspiracy around the profitability 
as it relates to putting people into prison. And I don't think that any, any system really wants that. What they want is safer communities and they want individuals who commit crimes not to commit crimes again after they commit a crime. Any other thoughts? Real uh, quick. I, I would just follow up. I agree with uh, Jerron that uh, I think there's a misconception pushed by the left out there that private prisons are what's driving our prison population. <clears throat> and I can tell you, no judge, no judge in the world is sitting on the bench with somebody in front of them that this judge has to sentence going, hmm, there's six beds open at the private prison and we have a contract to fill them, so I'm gonna send this guy to prison. It's just not how it works. Um, I think there's great private prisons like Jerron said and there's probably some that are not run so well, but I don't think they are the driver of our in, in incarcerated population. So f from a sheriff's perspective, we have, we use, uh, there are some jail vendors, private, private jail operations. And, and right now, because of our o overcrowded public jail, the, the county jail, I need them. I, I, I have to have them. And I, I got a strange feeling that uh, Sheriff Henderson probably has that same thing. His, his jail's probably full. My jail's full. So I either have to farm them out to him or somebody that has some vacancies, or I have to send them to a, to a vendor. Uh, the only thing that I, I've ever worried about with the private vendor side of it is, remember, it's all about dollars and cents, and it's a for-profit issue. So uh, you know, how are they training their personnel? Are they spending the time training? And are they following the same rules and regulations that we have to follow as sheriffs? So I, I think there are a lot of things we have to look into, but without them, we'd really be in a bind right now. Well, and it, it goes back to if we could, if we could draw the lines correctly on who we incarcerate, we could impact that issue as well. Other questions? Good morning, my name is Amoye. Um, Kind of like what you were saying um, earlier, it, it seems like if we just ended, my, in my opinion, ended the war on drugs, a lot of this, <laughs> the issues would go away, and especially with nonviolent crimes, filling the prisons, um, over, you know, incarcerating people, over policing, you know, certain crimes. Um, is there a push on, or do you think it would be possible, a push on the conservative side to, you know, end the war on drugs? So I'll give a brief response and then turn it over to the panel. Um, there is no question we failed the war on drugs. And make no mistake about it, if you look at the data, um, you'll reach the same conclusion. There, drugs fuels some violent crimes. There's no question that that's, that that's accurate. But what we do know is mental health is not being taken into consideration of, of most of the drug users. And we are using a one-size-fits-all hammer, which is to just incarcerate someone that might have a very low-level drug addiction problem. Once we start getting that right, you'll start to see we have a much better impact on, on the war on drugs, so to speak. And, and so I love that question. I'll turn it over to the panel. I'll agree. Yeah, I would just say that like uh, conservatives have certainly led on this issue. Um, the first step back, um, as, you, as you remember, it's, it was done in a Republican Congress. Um, conservatives like uh, the great Senator, Senator Cruz from Texas uh, were leaders who all were involved uh, with that reform effort. And uh, Brett knows this, but we built that legislation from scratch. Um, the prior legislation that, were, that existed uh, wasn't ever going to pass. And so uh, working with Brett, Brett Tolman and some of his leadership, we focused on prison reform and we're able to negotiate with Grassley on removing some of these uh, draconian policies like the three strike rule. And uh, that, to me, is a good example of how conservatives are showing leadership on changing um, the narrative around um, the war on drugs and correcting it so it can allow for safer communities and also for uh, more people to have access to opportunity. Well, let me highlight real quickly something many of you may not realize. <clears throat> Prior to the First Step Act, if you were a black kid in the inner city and you did cocaine, your sentence could be a hundred times longer than someone in suburbia, the United States, doing cocaine. And it all just came down to the difference between crack versus powder cocaine. Now, that's a bad policy. 
right? And that's a policy that led to unbelievable disparity in those who got arrested and how long they served, but it also resulted in incredibly long sentences for individuals who may not have any more um, you know, propensity to commit crime than, than any of the others. But we just arbitrary, arbitrarily made that based out of legislating out of fear. Um, so any other comments the panel has on the drug question? Nope, okay, next. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here. Question is, uh, the, the gangs are growing in Texas, and it's almost exponentially, and you know it's part of doing the, what's going on at the border. Uh, would you guys address how you're gonna deal with this before it hits one of us? Just being at a traffic light, and they're doing all these things where if you honk your horn at them, they'll you know, come after you, shoot you, all those kind of things. So what are you doing to address this before it hits every one of us? Thanks. Great question. Front lines, right? Texas is on the front lines. So what's being done? What needs to be done, Sheriff? Well, fortunately, uh, our governor and, and the state of Texas has identified this issue. And so now we have these tags, uh, anti-gang task force going on. And we have these tags that have a lot of uh, intelligence where we're trying to track these gang members. And, but you are 100% correct. It is border related. Uh, we're seeing it. Fortunately, I don't have too much of it in my county, but I'm starting to feel it and see it. I have more gang members in my jail now than I have ever had. So it's, it's really easy to just look at the trends and we try to identify the gang members as they do find themselves being incarcerated. Uh, but I don't know, I don't have that answer. As, as a Texas sheriff, I'll tell you, I don't have that answer other than we just need to continue to try and stop it at the border and then as we deal with the gang issues in, in the inner city, which is slowly but surely pushing out, uh, I, I feel quite sure that uh, Sheriff Henderson sitting behind you is, is having a lot of gang issues right now. Um, he and I both surround Harris County and what we're finding is most of our citizens and residents have a lot of disposable income, they have a great life and those gang members like to come out and try and steal those disposable items that we have purchased, whether it's boats, trailers, uh, you could go on and on. And that's, we're finding that most of the crime that is hitting some of our surrounding urban counties is coming from the inner city where those gangs are operating. So I, I, do, I wish I had a great answer for you, but I will tell you this, the governor is addressing it. Uh, he created just a, another new tag, this last legislative session that is up in uh, Tyler. Texas that uh, I think is operating as an eight county uh, region up there. So it, it is being addressed, but I, I don't I don't have an answer. Maybe well, maybe one of these prosecutors do. Well, I'll, I'll tell you first, secure the border. And you can't have a president that ignores it. It has to start at that level and then you have to have a governor. And we have the governor that is addressing it, but until you secure the border, you're not you're not stopping that pipeline, right? Once you stop the pipeline, You've got to free up your law enforcement so they're not just dealing with low-level misdemeanors and that they can actually get out and they can start to investigate and root out violent crime. It's a simple formula. It just has to be done now. And I think we have to ensure that there's room in your jails for them and not the drug users and the other people that are taking your beds. I, I got a call from a sheriff in rural county in uh, Utah. He called me, I was U.S. attorney at the time, and he said, what do you want me to do with them? I said, what do you mean? He says, I have 18 beds. All my beds are full. I just pulled over a U-Haul, and it's got 36 illegals in the back of it. They've been in there for three days. Five of them are notorious dealers and, and members of the gang. I have no room for them. What do you want me to do? We tried. Neighboring counties couldn't hold them. Uh, no, nobody had a solution. So he said, have a good day and send them on their way. Other questions? In, in the back. I know there's some up here in the front as well. Good morning, Andrew Parks, Government Relations Director, Texas State Technical College. Um, first things first, as a Jefferson County native, I wanna thank you for being here today, Sheriff Hawthorne. 
Um, so uh, at TSTC, we are in the early stages of developing a, a pilot program for vocational training for inmates. Uh, we have a sheriff's office that is uh, willing to partner with us, a very eager partner. Um, and we're trying to figure out right now how that would look and what sort of the best practices would be. It's something we know we have to get right, not only because of our funding formula, but because we think if we can get it right, because we're a state institution, it may work in other counties as well. So uh, my question to the, the policy core uh, on stage and, and joining us virtually today is if you had, a, a, had to design from the ground up a vocational program for inmates, what would it look like in a nutshell? Is it just for low-level offenders? Is there a way to incorporate violent offenders? Do you include juvenile offenders? Does it need to be done on site at the jail? Is it, does it need to be a condition of probation, et cetera? Well, I'm gonna answer that one real quick, then I'm gonna let somebody else touch it. One of the things, one of the problems that I have, and J-Ron probably has a lot more information on that kind of stuff, but I have a problem just finding the resources and facilities to teach them to read. That's why I, I sit back and I look at my jail population and one of the things that I have found in common is many of them don't even have a proficiency to read and write. And, and the jail that I have was built in the 80s. I don't have any form of a classroom. I don't even have a secure area to hold church. We have it. We have church, you know, twice a week, but, but, but no facility inside to, to, to do something like that. So I think uh, the educational aspect would be tremendous, but I think we've got to start at the very bottom. I, I don't, I'm not sure how we put them in a vocation until we first help them get that education or at least a little bit of that education that many of them missed in the opportunities of public school. Yeah, I can weigh in on that a little bit. Um, from the leadership from uh, Senator Casey, um, Cassidy, I'm sorry, uh, from Louisiana, uh, he uh, pushed for a dyslexia provision um, to be put into uh, educational um, the educational aspect of the first step back. Um, in many cases, um, on the federal level, um, that we had those same problems that we didn't have facilities. Um, we didn't have uh, program and, and teachers 